Resentment. What makes us tick? I love the word tick. I just never knew it meant that. What is the motive and the explanation for your behavior? See, like we can never get enough of that. We, we have so many flaws. Man, God made the perfect biological specimen known to man with, and men can't even understand biologically how we function. Flawless. The liver and the kidney and the hearts and the white blood cells and the red blood cells and the brain, the endorphins, uh, the emotions, uh, uh, the, the, the brain signals the leg to move. Uh, I mean, he made it perfect. The digestive system. Uh, wow. Isn't it amazing? It is designed to heal itself. It's self-sufficient, it's independent. But boy, when we got to our character, how do we become so flawless and yet our bodies and our anatomy is so perfect? Because see, he made our character and our anatomy to be together as one. We were supposed to be perfect when he created us. But there was a problem. Actually, there was two problems. There was our self-consciousness, and then there was the devil. There was our self-consciousness, and then there was the devil. There was our self-consciousness, and then there was the devil. There was you, yourself, and I. Not me, but your I. There was your pride, your flesh, your consciousness, your stubbornness, your resentment, your bitterness, your hatred, your anger, and then the devil. And what the devil did is he said this, I'm just going to use what they already given me. I ain't got to do anything to make somebody bitter. They're going to do it on their own. I'm just going to make it keep going. As long as I can. That's my job. So soon as they start to walk out of it, and forgiveness starts to settle in, bam! Hit you with another brick. Man, you meet a different man and he's the same as the old man. Why do I keep finding these dudes? You meet one girl and she's the same as the other girl. And this is what the enemy does. So, how do we gain control of all this? Our consciousness and our enemy. Well, the only way you're going to gain control over any situation in your life is to be in control. a lot of commitment, takes a lot of obedience, but most of all, it takes a lot of wisdom to understand what's going on. Amen? Amen. And so thus, this is the reason for the series. This is the reason why we're getting into it. We start off with resentment is that attitude towards people or something. Resentment is a negative emotional state. Some of us can stay in that disposition for a long time. The word disposition is, it means your tendency. Sometimes your tendency is to continue to, to be negative about things because you're still bitter about certain things and you don't want to change because sometimes it's your fuel. Sometimes it's your defense mechanism. Sometimes it's your weapon of destruction. Sometimes you use it to hurt and last shot. Sometimes you use it to express yourself because you know no other way. But most of the time, it's unhealthy. 
And resentment is a, it's an emotional state that combines annoyance, anger, dislike, hatred, and other negative feelings. And we went on to say that resentment interferes with a person's ability to relate to another person. I want to make this clear that both resentment and bitterness is passive aggressive behavior. Okay? It, it reacts to anger. The word passive aggressive, for those that don't know what it means, it's expressing a negative feeling. When you have resentment and bitterness, you have a passive aggressive behavior. That means you're constantly, constantly displaying a negative vibe, a negative feeling, a negative emotion. You are a negative Nancy or a negative Johnny and you're just not happy. It's an emotional state. See, by you knowing it's an emotional state, therefore you can get out of it. But we got to be willing to get out of it. Some of us, we don't want to get out of it. We like it. And so resentment is often hidden. Oh, you don't want people to know that you're resentment because we're always running around trying to be holy. Mm -hmm. If you had to take a, a, a survey and the church would be 100% honest and they would tell you that they struggle with resentment, I guarantee it would be 80% of the church. And I guarantee you would say, them? I thought she had it all together. Him? I thought he was a strong man of God. Because you have resentment, it doesn't nullify your strength in God. It doesn't, it doesn't disqualify you from heaven. It doesn't cast you down as unworthy. No, it just says that you struggle with emotions. That's all. So you gotta fix that. And I'm sure it's not the first time you've been convicted about it. I'm sure that little voice, the little, you know, the one that sits on your shoulder like a cartoon, he's always talking to you. And then the other one jumps up and beats him up. Shut up, shut up. No, no, I don't want to. Now you know you need to forgive him. No, don't forgive them. They'll do the same thing. But Jesus wants you to forgive them. Don't listen to Jesus. <laughs> Forget about what he said. And then you struggle back and forth all your life. And then you take on your cause. You know your cause? You know your cause. Your cause. They hurt me. I'm still upset. You take on your cause, you know your cause. I'll never let them hurt me again. You take on your cause, you know your cause. Until they come back and bow down at my feet and ask for forgiveness, I will never, ever, ever forgive them. You know your cause, right? He better do what I told him to do. You know your cause, right? You see, when I say that to you, it's supposed to go on the inside of you and expose your stuff. We call it your junk. That's your cause. You're carrying all that junk inside. And you're like a little gremlin or a little leprechaun that got a pot of gold. Nobody can touch my junk, it's mine. So through the years, God sends one person, two person, three person, four person, trying to get some of your junk. And he say, no, it's mine. It's my cause. It allows me to be this way. Mm. Resentment is often hidden. The word hidden means concealed or out of sight. It says that resentment is uh, often repressed. Repressed means, it, it, the repressed means that uh, the thought and feeling or desire is unconsciously hidden in your mind. You don't even know that you have repressed it. Because all this time, you're holding on to your hurt and anger. 
and it feels good, it feels right. And you're thinking you have the right to feel this way, to act this way, to be this way, and to live this way. And guess what? You wake up and it's 20 years later. The person that has fed you is dead. And you didn't learn nothing. You just took all that and moved it on to the next incident. The next situation. Remember we talked about resentment is, is having an attitude towards something or, 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 or someone. So what it does, it, it follows you to the next relationship, the next meeting, the next situation. Therefore, you stay the same. All this time hiding and repressing. And guess what? When you hide resentment and you repress it, it continues to function inside of you. Therefore, bringing no relief, no understanding, no wisdom, no knowledge of why you act this way. And so you begin to take on all these false truths that I act this way because I grew up this way. I asked this way because my mama made me this way. I act this way because I had an abusive husband. I act this way because all my relationships fell. I act this way because I, 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 I don't have a good job. So I act that way because I don't make good money, so I am going to act that way. No, you act that way because you want to act that way. Where? Where? Grow up. Look, get rid of it, but here's a new thing. Get over it. Get over it. Come on, you're still holding on to it. He's gone. She's gone. <laughs> Get over it. Resentment. Resentment is a negative reaction to events that you see as being unfair. It was unfair how they did me. Oh, I'm going to hate them forever. It was unfair. Resentment is a negative reaction to an event that you see it was unfair. Was it unfair that you got your heart broken? I had my heart broken, my first love. She slept with another guy and I saw pictures of it. <laughs> I immediately snatched my chain off her neck. <sighs> Called her all kinds of names that ain't even in Webster Dictionary book. <sighs> Went and got me a six pack of Old English, 16 ounces. <laughs> Tall boys we used to call it. Got to the fourth one and started throwing up. <laughs> and I still cried. I took her to the airport. I paid for a plane ticket. She slept with Daryl Clark, who was a running back for uh, Arizona State. He promised he was going to get her into college. She was my high school sweetheart. She was the love of my life. She had green eyes and she was light-skinned. <laughs> she had good hair. She was a freak too. And she turned me out and turned me in. <laughs> and I hated women for the next 10 years. I became a woman slayer. Because I was resentful. Her name is Kim Foster. Say, Kim, look at me now. <laughs> I'm over you. Like I tell my kids, it was my first love, my must love, my trust love that breaks your heart. Yeah, I made that up for them. I prepared them for the heartbreak that's to come. It's that first love, that trust love, that must love that breaks your heart. And some of us can't recover. Oh, but that first love, that must love, that trust love that broke your heart, you gotta forgive it. And you gotta move on. But I never, I never loved like that before. But it wasn't even love, it was lust. What do I know about love at 18? I was just a hormonal little guy running around. Just horny. That's all. Ain't got no excuse for it. It's just the truth. 
Some of y'all are old and you're still horny. You need to stop it. Okay? Get over it! If resentment is left unchecked and allowed to continue, it can change someone's nature. What is nature? Nature is your character and your complexion. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Is it your true self or is it your hidden complexion? Resentment left unchecked can change the nature of who you are, the very character and your complexion. Your complexion, not your skin color, gonna change. The inside of you change. Where you once was a soul of light and, and upbeat and happiness and, and free and helpful and loving, now your soul is dark and you're selfish and you're protective and you're isolated and you're contained and you no longer put yourself out there because you don't want to be hurt again. Don't let resentment turn you into the wicked witch or the wickedest man in the world. You gotta learn to let it go. Believe me, it will only destroy you from within. And if it's left unchecked, resentment becomes bitterness. And bitterness is a whole nother animal. Resentment is the mental process of repeatedly replaying a feeling and the events leading up to it. When you are full with resentment, you repeatedly play the crime that caused you to be resentful. Just like I did about Kim. My first love. And this is where the anger comes from. You see, every time you start to heal a little bit, every time you start to grow a little bit, you'll have that repetitively replaying of the video again. And then what happens is it continues to spark that little, that little amber becomes a flame again. You know how a fire is getting ready to go out and, it, and it's just amber's left and if you throw some fuel on it, some wood, some clothes, anything, it starts again. That's how resentment is. It's almost like you got rid of it. It's almost gone. You're almost to the finish line. You're almost healed. And all of a sudden that new person reminds you of the old person. And then emotionally, we throw fuel right back onto that fire that was just about to go out. Dang it. Dang it. Just lost your new girl that, guess what? God sent you that person. And you just threw them in the trash can. Resentment is the mental process. The mental process. The mental process. What do you mean? What? What? You mean it's not the physical anatomy? No, it's the mental. It's here! You ever heard someone say you're mental? Yeah, why did they say that to you? Yeah, you were acting pretty mental, huh? <laughs> it's the mental process that repeatedly plays the incident that causes you to stay angry. So how do you deal with that? We'll get to that. We re-experience, we relive, and then we go through all this emotional scar tissue all over again. And then it grows and it becomes spiritually. And then it becomes destructive. And then it becomes a family rift. Or then it becomes a, a, a severed friendship. But it's all mental. And it is the root of everything. See, resentment embodies, the word embody means to make concrete. Ooh. Resentment embodies a basic choice. It makes concrete in your mental and emotional state a basic choice. You know what it is? It's I refuse to forgive. to forgive. It embodies it. It makes it concrete. You know concrete? 
You know that stuff out there? Think about it, concrete. Look at it right now. You know, your driveway, that's in your head. Sealed. You didn't bury forgiveness in it. Mm -hmm. It's going to have a hard time breaking out of that. Don't let resentment embody that basic choice. Did you notice I said basic choice? Do you know I said the word choice? Do you know I used choice? Did you hear me say choice? Did I say choice? I can't be. It, it must not be choice. The basic choice, the minimum of all choices, the least of all choices, the least you can do, the not hard choice to make, the real simple one to do, the basic choice of I refuse to forgive. What are some of the reasons why you would refuse to forgive someone? I understand. Someone murdered your family member, right? That may be hard for you. But really, most of our resentment and anger comes from a relationship that was failed. Whether it was one of, of intimacy or one of relationship. And that's it. Nobody got murdered but your pride. Nothing got broken but your heart. Your bones still work. Your feet still move. Your mind still thinks. Your mouth still works. But your heart has grown so cold. Resentment. Being resentful or angry allows you to hold on to the hurts and never let them go and never get over them. Instead of releasing their pain through forgiveness, they rehearse it over and over again in their mind. Years and years of same thing repetitively playing in your mental process of thinking. And guess what it's instilling? It's instilling the basic belief. It is embodying the basic belief it is concreting your choice that you have to forgive them. You are doing it. Not the devil. Not Harold. Not Sheila. You. Not Kim. Me. It ain't hard at all, guys. It's only hard because you have repetitively told yourself that you will never forgive. Why did you say that? Well, I didn't say it out loud. I know, you said it in the mental process. You embodied it. <coughs> you embodied the basic choice that would have set you free. You are choosing it. Nobody else but you. You have no right to hold on to that pain. You have no right to hold on to that pain. Some of y'all look like you're about to cry. <laughs> but I want to. That's good, that's good. That's the first exception in being an alcoholic. First, you have to acknowledge that you are a resentaholic. Hi, my name is Mike, and I'm a resentaholic. I've carried this around for many, many years. It started from my unconditional beliefs when I was a child. I resented where I live. I resented the way I was raised. I resented my mom always liked my brother more than me. I resented that my sister always got the gifts. I resented that my mom had different 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 men and my sisters and them are all half sisters. I resented that my dad beat me up. I, re, I, re, I, re, I resented, I resented that I didn't make the starting position on the football team. I resented the coach. I resented everything. I resented my mom because her and my dad divorced and my dad said it was her fault and I believed him so I hate women. Oh, we got, we're so flawed. 
You get it? You get it? You get it? You got some junk that we got to get rid of. Nobody can take my junk. I'm keeping it. And there you are. You're not 30. You just turned 35. There you are. You're not 37. There you are. You're 42 now. There you are, 47 years of age. Still pissed off <laughs> about Kim Foster. There you are, grandkids. What unconscious belief are you teaching them? Come here, come here, little boy. Life ain't fair. Okay, thanks, Grandpa. Thanks, Grandma. <laughs> You know, you're gonna grow up and people are gonna take advantage of you and you're never gonna have nothing. Look at me, I ain't got nothing but a pickup truck. <laughs> you know, your marriage, your mama pisses me off. That woman crazy. <laughs> and then that unconditional beliefs begin to scar you. And unconsciously, they lay in the back of your head, sabotaging your emotions, sabotaging your relationships, causing you to have a emotion, emotional uh, uh, response to a situation that you didn't even know you felt that way about. You see how we reciprocate and reduplicate the process of being ignorant over and over again? Because we don't know. Stop it. Get rid of it. Don't do it no more. Don't be negative in front of your kids, in front of your co-worker. See resentment for what it is. It is a mental process. That means you can get a grip of it unless you are institutionally insane. Resentful people will express their resentment in two ways. Now we don't get to the crazy people. Maybe you have a screaming aunt or uh, a drunken uncle that's always ah. Ah, 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 ah. Come here, mijo. Let me tell you something. Okay? Never listen to a woman. They don't know they're local. They don't know nothing. You hear me? They know nothing. You, you be a man. Give me another beer, mijo. You want one? Here we go. This is what men do. We drink, get drunk, and fart. Yeah. That's what we do. We don't listen to nobody. Boy, that uncle is jacked up, huh? He needs to shut his mouth, huh? And he definitely don't need to talk when he's drinking. Okay? He can barely say anything right when he's sober. Resentful people will express their resentment in two ways. They will clam up and internalize their anger. They will also blow up and explode their anger onto others. I just asked for a sandwich, mama. Why did you say I remind you of daddy? Daddy left us a long time ago. I just wanted some milk with my cookies, mama. Why you say I'm just like my grandmother? <laughs> oh, I know some exploding bombs in my life. Mm -hmm. Bam! They just explode on you. And you'd be like, uh, that commercial? Want to get away? <laughs> you'd be like, I didn't mean to start that subject. Sorry. See, when they blow up and explode onto others, both responses are unhealthy and unhelpful. But listen, some people climb up and then they blow up. So you get both. And a person that is clammed up and blows up, they are most destructive of all because they never are going to give up. Some people hold on resentment because they feel it's a part of their character because it becomes their nature of who they are and they don't have no knowledge that they're acting that way. And so when we implode it, when we internalize it, when we keep it in, it's, it has a negative effect on everything we do. I think the people that internalize resentment are the most deadliest one of all. Because everybody knows a loudmouth person, that's me, 
I'll explode on you in a minute and then I forgot about it. I don't hold a grudge. I can't remember the, the crime. I'll be like, that's it, that? Sorry. I'll say sorry in a minute. It ain't no problem for me to apologize to you. Sorry. I chastise my kids and I, I may mean, win a little talk on them and, and then I'll come back. Now you know. Now you know. Then I start thinking about parenthood now. I don't want to let them off the hook because they're going to think I'm soft. So, but, but I got to. I gotta fix this because I didn't mean to, to, to have it like that. See, I have conviction on me right now that you shouldn't have talked to your kids that way. Go apologize. But God, I'm the parent. I know, but imagine if you teach them this humility and respect. They're gonna love you even more. And guess what? You break the cycle. See, my dad never came and apologized to me. No, he beat the living crap out of me and kept on walking. <laughs> And said, what? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> My mom never apologized to me. She beat the little crap out of me and kept on walking and said, what? I'm going to tell your daddy. <laughs> no, 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 no. You see, but I don't want to be that way. Because I realize that this is a mental process. And just because my mom and dad was like that, I don't have to be like that. So I've always been an out-of-the-box thinker. I've always been someone that wanted to be different. I've always been a person that didn't want to treat people the way I was treated. I always believed that one scripture in the Bible that says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Even though my environment was hostile and negative, so I go to my kids and I say, hey, I remember what I said about that, but maybe I shouldn't have said it like that, so I want to apologize to you. All right, you forgive me? And we go on. And you know, when you can walk in that kind of character, God is doing something in your life. It didn't make you, it didn't diminish your parenthood. It didn't diminish your authority. It just gave a whole lot to your respect and your character of who you are as a person. And acknowledging that person, even though there are kids, as an equal person that deserves respect. You see? See, a lot of things we do to our kids, or we say, is because it's an unconditional belief, but it's what, we just have all that negativity. Remember, resentment is a person that is in a negative emotional state. Resentment is a person that is in a negative emotional state and that state is I'm annoyed I dislike I hate you make me sick and we gotta remember that we can't carry that resentment around because then it kills all the work that Christ did on the cross it destroys every good work you've ever done it allows you to have other brothers and sisters stumble because they see who you are. It kills the glory of salvation. Resentment. Resentment. We cannot let resentment control our nature, our character, who we are. We can't embody and seal it in our hearts. We got to get rid of it. Resentment is as old as Genesis 4. Do you guys all know the story of Cain slaying Abel? I'm going to close with this. Genesis 4, and I'm going to read it in the Amplified Version. First of all, the fall of man was 4,000 B.C., okay? Cain killed Abel in 3,000 B.C. So from the time Adam and Eve was kicked out of the garden, they started having babies. And so from the time that they started having babies, which they say Cain was the firstborn and Abel was the secondborn, to the time that Abel was dead, it was almost 1,000 years. Now, I don't know if Adam and Eve had their first baby at 263 years of age. We don't know that. It just says that Adam was with his wife and she conceived the child. 
So, but anyway, I want you to know this. This is a long time of having resentment. The only reason I'm telling you about 4,000 B.C. versus 3,000 B.C. because I want you to know it's a thousand man years. And I don't know exactly how long Cain had resentment in his heart, but I guarantee it was hundreds of years. When you read the Bible and you read the story, you think it was just chronologically happened, like the next week. No. It grew and grew. And there was more offerings and more sacrifices. And it grew and it grew. And so I want to tell you the story in closing. Now, verse 1, now the man Adam knew Eve, and this is in the Amplified Version, as his wife. And she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have obtained a man, a baby boy, a son, with the help of the Lord. And later she gave birth to his brother, Abel. And now Abel kept the flocks, the sheep and the goats. And Cain cultivated the ground. And in the course of time, in a course of time, in a course of time, of time as they grew up and they learned that Adam taught them this is what we do we bring offerings to God we bring sin offerings we bring blood offerings and this is our tradition and we give these offerings to God because we want him to bless us if we've sinned in our life we offer this up you see this is after the falling state of man this is out of the garden so as soon as they got out of the garden Adam and Eve raised their children up and the admonition of the Lord of what to do which was pleasing to God. So the custom started way back then. So Cain and Abel was raised to give offerings unto God. And with God, what they taught their kids is that when you do give an offering, you give from your heart. You give the best. Because this is how God was. And this is what he expected. And it says in the course of time, Cain brought the Lord an offering of fruit of the ground. Now, is there something wrong with the offering of fruit from the ground? No. But there's something wrong with it when you're giving it not from your heart. There's something wrong with it when you're just doing it and not doing it the way your mom and dad taught you how to go to God. And so this was why God got upset. He didn't get upset that he brought him fruit. But here's what he should have did. God has never accepted a fruit offering in his life. God has never accepted a fruit offering in his life. Therefore, Christ wouldn't have had to come and shed blood. He could have just brought a basket of fruit. And we could have had salvation, right? But no, he had to be a blood. God has always asked for a blood offering. Always. And that's why he gave Christ. He had to shed his blood and die for our sins. So in knowing this, Cain already, being a knucklehead, with an attitude, said, I'm going to do it different this way. Imagine this probably three, four hundred years. He probably, for the first two hundred years, he brought a blood sacrifice. But he saw that big watermelon that was the biggest he ever grew. He saw that big pumpkin that was the biggest he ever grew. That big squash. You know how you see on TV the farmers that grow the biggest world. But imagine he was like this. God, look what I got. And he laid it at the oven. He had a turnip. He had a watermelon. He had a zucchini squash. And he had a pumpkin. And they were gigantic. <laughs> How could he think that God wanted that? Okay? But this is what he thought. And so it says that <clears throat> he brought an offering from the fruit of the ground. And in Abel, the baby brother, the keeper of the sheep, and the flock, he said that uh, and Abel brought an offering of the finest, firstborn of his flock, and the fat portions. See, this is where that saying, the fat belongs to the Lord. God always wants you to sacrifice the precious fat part of an offering. And then you were supposed to take the meat and divide it up. But the fat was what God wanted. And that's why in the Leviticus is the fat belongs to the Lord. The priest wasn't allowed to eat it. It was burnt up in the offering. It was a, something that 
Don't ask me why God wanted it, but it was part of the Jewish tradition. And that's why Cain knew that, uh, Abel knew that, and so did Cain. And it says that he brought forth the firstborn of the flock and the fat portions, and the Lord had respect. And the Lord had respect, regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no respect. You're going to bring me a watermelon, son? <laughs> and you want me to bless that? You're going to bring me a turnip? And you want me to... Listen, son, for 300 years, have you ever seen anybody bring me a bushel of wheat? Is this how important I am to you? This is our annual sacrifice where we bring our finest and we present it to the Lord. And so look what goes on. But Cain offers, he had no respect. And so Cain became angry. Indignant. Indignant means this. It's a feeling of showing anger or annoyance for what you deem as unfair. Resentment. <laughs> it was unfair to God to Abel's offering and he didn't take mine. Abel brought a firstborn of the finest stock and the fat and gave it to the Lord and I brought a turnip and a watermelon. <laughs> and he became angry. He, came, he became indignant. Indignant is a different thing. It's part of resentment. When you become resentment, you're indignant because you feel like it's unfair. It's more than anger. So the unfairness fuels your resentment. It makes you justify that you're right to feel this way because he cheated on me and it was unfair. Well, she cheated on me and it was unfair too, Kim Foster. <laughs> it was unfair, Lorraine. But I'm going to get over it. Bless the Lord. And so it went on and, 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 and it says he was indignant and, and he looked annoyed and hostile. Some of y'all have had that look before, huh? Annoyed and hostile. That's when the husband better get the heck out of the house fast. <laughs> They'd be like, just go to sleep, sweetie. <laughs> my mom was annoyed and hostile when she boiled them grits and was about to burn my daddy with her. He was a changed man after that day. <laughs> She woke him up and it was right over him and he was like, hey baby, and I'm, I'm sorry. She was annoyed and hostile and she was indignant, okay? She was resenting that she ever married that man at that time. And so it, it says that he looked annoyed and hostile. You, have you guys ever thought about it? We pray our whole life to hear one little squeak from God, don't we? Lord, let me just hear your voice. Let me know that it's you, God. Because our minds always talk for us and we say, that was God. The Lord told me. That's why I told God, don't be talking to my mind. Send me a sign. So he says, hey, we'll close the gate. He says, hey, we'll still be wide. See, I can talk that way. But if he says it in my mind, I would go crazy. Is that me? The Holy Spirit? Or my fear? Or the devil? Uh, uh, my mama? My daddy? Uh, my auntie? Who's in my head? You ever talk to yourself? And then you question yourself? Well, imagine you, you get ready to make a life decision and you say, God told me. You better make sure God told you that. And make sure it wasn't you, yourself, and I. Okay? Now, these guys, God talked to them all day long. They were out of the garden. He still had a relationship. Listen to his conversation with Cain. Just God coming to me and comforting me would have took away all my resentment. But this just shows you how mental humans are. How we hold on to that root of resentment and it becomes bitterness. And even if God himself came from heaven to talk to you, you would still hold on to your resentment. Yeah, you would. We have an example of a human being doing it as early as Genesis 4. 
And here's what it said. It said, and the Lord said to Cain, the Lord, yes, God, Yahweh, Elohim, and the Nile, Jehovah, he said to Cain, he said, why are you so angry? He said, why do you look annoyed? He said, if you do well, that means believing in me, doing what is acceptable and pleasing to me, will you not be accepted? And he said, but if you do not do well and ignore my instructions, sin crouches at your door. In the Hebrew, that meaning sin crouches at your door means a demon is ready to jump on you. Who? Oh, really? All this from resentment. If God came in this room right now and the Holy Spirit went to every person in this room and prophetically called out your resentment, the offense, the person, the date, and the time, and told you to get rid of it, would you let it go? Oh, uh, well, let's, let's, let's test it. Would you let it go? See, you can't say no definitively. You can't. And you know what? That's sad. And here's what he said to Cain. He said, sin crouches at your door and the desire is for you to overpower you. And he says, but you must master it. You must master your resentment. You must master your bitterness. You must master it, guys. We can do it. God himself said, look, it's a hard thing to do, but you got to master it. You got to. Because if you don't, sin is crouching at your door. And sin will destroy your life. And then he went on and said this. He says, uh, he says, it wants to empower you, but you must master it. Cain talked with his brother about what God has said. And then when the two were alone working in the field, Cain attacked his brother and killed him. Stop. Stand up. I want you guys to know the time frame. I told you from the time men fall, it was 4,000 years. And from the time that Cain slew Abel, it was 1,000 years, 3,000 BC. We figure Adam and Eve procreated 127, 263. We know that the boys were well adults, well over 100 years old. And imagine this incident of his offering being rejected. It started from resentment because he thought it was unfair that God would accept his offering and not mine. And guess what happened? For years, he allowed resentment to become bitter until it became hostile, until it became hatred, until he killed. Even though God came to him and told him. Human nature, we're hard-headed, aren't we? But as my mom used to tell me, a hard head makes a soft butt in the long run. So you can choose to stay hard-headed, or you can take this teaching of resentment and understand that it is a mental process. Understand that it is a basic choice that you choose to not forgive someone. Understand that it comes from a hurt that you deem that was unfair. If you can get those three basic things out of resentment and gain that as knowledge and wisdom, you can control your resentment. But it happens. 
Resentment is a human emotion that will fall upon us for any time it wants to. It is something that is attached to our anger. Our natural response in anger is to become resentful. A natural response for resentment is to become bitterness. And a natural response of bitterness is to become hateful and hostile. And therefore, one sin, one sin leads to another. Because sin is crouching at your door. A demon is ready to pounce on you. From resentment. Kim Foster, I forgive you. And you know what? It was just the greatest thing that ever happened. It hurt him, but it grew me up. And it embraced me for the women in my life that came after you. But I forgive you, Kim. Okay? We friends. Resent me, guys. I want you when you go home tonight, I want you to examine your resentment. Listen, we all have it. Some of us is over it, but some of us are still controlled by it. And if you're still controlled by it, God wants you to be set free because he wants you to know that if you don't let it go, if you don't get rid of it, it will become sin in your life. And it will cause havoc. Amen? Resentment. The next emotion we're going to discuss is fear. Did you guys get something out of resentment? Yes. So, so far we've done guilt, resentment, and now we're going to do fear. How many are driven by some kind of fear in your life? It, it doesn't mean boogeyman fear, okay? It could be fear of failure. It could be any kind of fear. Well, the Bible says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's all we need to know. That fear is never from God. You understand? So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the word today. We thank you for resentment. We thank you for teaching us about it. We thank you, Father, that even in Genesis, when before Cain slew his brother, you you went and you pleaded with him. You, 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 you threw yourself on the line to ask him to, to not do this. You, you warned him, Father. You, you pleaded with him. You, you told him to, to, to change the course that he's on. And, and yet in our lives, Father, many times we, 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 we don't want to listen to your voice. We don't want to listen to your unctioning. Father, sometimes we don't hear your voice, but we feel your unctioning. We feel your, your, your conviction in our life. We feel your pulling to say, hey, you shouldn't be that way. This ain't right. You need to stop that. Father, I ask that right now in the name of Jesus that you would open up our hearts, Father, to receive your unctioning, to receive when you, when you guide us, to receive when you instruct us, Father. And right now, Father, I feel like you're speaking to our hearts that there's some things in our lives that we need to let go. There's some things in our life that we've been holding on to. There's some things that we need to break off of because they're not healthy, Father. And Father, we've been walking this road for a long time holding on to some things that we don't need to hold on to. So Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I thank you that we break off every spirit of resentment over everybody that's in this room. Holy Spirit, that you would go and loose that. Go and let it be done. Go and break it off of them, Father. Father, that they can walk in peace, that they can walk in joy, that they can find some kind of relief for their pain. And Father, as we endeavor so hard to live right, we ask for your grace. We ask that you forgive us. Father, that you forgive us for being stubborn. Forgive us, Father, for being unforgiven. Forgive us, Father, for not making the choice to forgive the offense that was done unto us. Father, I ask that you just heal us right now in the name of Jesus. That you just go inside of us. Father, each and every one of us, only you know how to minister. Holy Spirit, minister. 
to your people. Begin to break off those branches that are rotten and decaying. Begin to cut off those roots that no longer produce good fruit. Begin to break the stuff off of us that decays. Give us life, Lord Jesus. Give us freedom. Give us, Father, the heart to heal. Let us change the way we do things. Expose the enemy for what he is in our lives. Break off those unconditional beliefs of resentment that we've been molded into that has controlled us for many of years. Begin to set us free, Lord Jesus. I thank you for freedom. I thank you for my freedom. I thank you for my joy. I thank you for my peace. I thank you for my healing. And I thank you for theirs. In Jesus' name, amen.